of their site information management systems. These discussions are being organized by ET EDI, and we have two goals with them. First, we wanted to introduce the new EDI-affiliated information managers to the breadth of tools and workflows that are used by information managers throughout the LTR and beyond. And with that in mind, we have asked experienced information managers with very mature information management systems to the, discuss their approaches to common IM tasks like acquiring data and metadata from the scientists, processing the data, QA, QC, storing it in their site IMS, and generating EML and interacting with PASTA. So that's our first goal. And our second is to try to identify, identify tools or scripts that have been developed at one site that may have applications to other sites if they could be generalized. EDI is going to be initiating a code library at the ESIP meeting, and we're looking for candidate scripts possibly to put into that library. So last week we had a great presentation from James Connors about the system that he developed with his colleagues for managing Palmer and CCE LTR data. And today we'll hear about a different approach used by John Porter from the VCR LTER. John has been the information manager for the VCR, I believe, since um, the VCR was established. Is that right, John? You yep. can go ahead and begin. Yep. Nope, that's, a, that's, that's the case. As a matter of fact, as a graduate student, I was responsible for printing off the first VCR LTR proposal on the university's laser printer. There was only Ooh. one, <laughs> which tells you something about that, which dates me rather badly. Anyway, I'm going to, uh, to, share, uh, to share a screen here where I've got some PowerPoint stuff, but I want everybody to feel free to sort of, uh, sort of jump in there, and uh, um, hopefully that's uh, shown up on the screen okay there? Yes, it is. Okay, uh, but any, if, I, if I start uh, talking on about things, please jump in there and, and stop me. So, uh, let's see. If you'd start recording, that would be great, John. Yeah, no, I actually uh, actually did start recording earlier. Let's say, well, let's say, nope, let's, uh, it's not like my email. Anyway, so my roadmap for this is to, to talk just a little bit about the our objectives, resources here, a little bit, as you discussed, about uh, collecting the metadata, curation, data sharing, and then I've got a, sort of a couple of special topics uh, uh, there. So that's that's what we'll be talking about. Now, uh, I always I always want to start off with any talk on in LTR information management on the fact that LTR management information management is there to promote ecological science. Okay, it's it's not per se uh, information management or information technology in the purest sense. It's there in, in service of a, of a purpose. And so my focus is on things that are going to help that purpose go forward. Uh, the, uh, and, then, and then to make sure that we're good participants in the larger community as well. Uh, this is our, our, our current uh, website. Right now it's got a giant picture of uh, one of our barrier islands, lest you wonder what the Virginia Coast Preserve looks like. Uh, that's, that's what it looks like. And uh, this is the type of information that we have on that website. We're going to be focusing really on this section, and I don't know whether the arrow shows up or not, but we're going to be focusing up in this data section of it. But there's a lot of other things that we try to put on the website that help to promote the science. Uh, you know, having access to theses and dissertations, uh, having access to proposals and annual reports is, is often useful for people that are doing, doing work on their site. Um, and then there's also things that are very useful for reporting to, to NSF. Um, now, where do we get our data from? It depends, the, the form that we get data from depends a lot on who we're getting it from. Uh, generally speaking, if we're talking about individual researchers, uh, we're talking about, and there's somebody has got a, uh, an unmuted uh, mic out there that was scratching there. Anyway, um, spreadsheets are the main way that we get data from individual researchers. However, for a lot of our technicians that are collecting our long-term data sets, we will actually set them up with a, a database management system, typically an access set of forms for, for adding data. Uh, 
we'll talk uh, quite a bit more about the automated sensors in a minute, so I won't won't really discuss them right now. And then we're uh, uh, and then we'll talk a, a bit about uh, the, the the metadata aspect uh, uh, right away. Any any sort of questions on that? Uh, the um, now one of the things that we do is we do prioritize what how we expend our efforts. We do not, you know, the uh, the sloppiest graduate student data set does not get the same attention that our long-term uh, data sets do. So our major focus is on that long-term data collected by our researchers. And of course, if we don't archive the data that comes from our researchers, nobody else will. Um, so that's why we, we focus on those. For graduate students, if the, if the uh, investigator associated with that student feels that that data has legs, that that data will be useful in the future. We will will pursue that for archiving. Uh, otherwise, what we do is encourage students to put a data appendix on their thesis so that the data is actually there and the thesis itself constitutes the metadata for it. But that's for data that we don't necessarily anticipate is going to be widely used or widely, widely applicable. And then occasionally we will take external data and, and put it as, in as part of our system because it's particularly useful to VCR, LTER researchers. Uh, that tends to be often sort of some of the GIS products or things of where there has been additional processing done on something. Otherwise, we would prefer just to point them to wherever we got the data from originally and let them get it from there as well. Um, now, one of the issues is how do I de we identify which data sets to, to manage? Uh, existing long-term data, really easy because uh, we've got them in our database already. We can see that, hey, this one hasn't been updated in a while. It's time to, to uh, you know, pursue the investigator that's responsible for that and find out where the newer data is. Uh, for the brand new data sets, I do a lot of looking at what papers and presentations have come out. And if I look at one and go, hey, I don't remember a data set that has anything to do with that, then I uh, will pursue that investigator uh, about that. Um, I have a couple of sort of uh, general lines that I use on that in terms of motivating the investigators. Uh, the first one is the one I tell them, which is if your research is important, then so is your data and it needs to be archived. I don't tell them, but I imply <laughs> that if your data isn't important enough to archive, it's your research probably isn't very good or very important either, <laughs> which is exactly the thing the researchers are most afraid of. So, uh, uh, and then I also mentioned the fact that, uh, that NSF will be checking to see the data that we use in our proposal that are, you know, if we have sort of major points that we're making and results of prior support, that data has got to be there or we're really putting ourselves at risk of, of, of having a problem. So, um, so if you want your research to be highlighted, by gosh, you better, better make sure we can, uh, we can, we have a copy of it on the web. Um, now for, uh, uh, the metadata part of things. Uh, the metadata is generated using, like I say, a metadatabase system, relational database with a uh, uh, with some form front ends, um, and the data is stored in in whatever form it typically comes in. Though usually, what we will do is to take it and put it in the sort of most general, simplest form we can. So if somebody gives me a spreadsheet file, typically what we will archive is the comma separated value file because we don't have to worry about having a copy of the software that will currently work. We have some data sets that because they, uh, they are using the formulas in the uh, spreadsheet itself, like for instance, there was a climate model that was done several years ago using a spreadsheet. And if you save the, the comma separate value file, all it does is stores simply the, uh, uh, the values, but it, the model is lost. So that one started off as a Lotus 1, 2, 3 file. And every time a sort of new version of spreadsheet comes along. I reopen that, resave it, uh, and so there's now a series of different 
spreadsheet versions of that one. But I do not want to do that for all my data. I want to make it that I can put it in a stable form that's going to have, have a, a long, long lifetime. Uh, and so I used the database system, the relational database system for the metadata, but not for the data. The data sort of stands as it is. Um, now, our metadata base uh, consists of a, a number of tables. This is, uh, is all of the, the major ones there. There's some minor ones out there for things like URLs and that sort of thing. Uh, basically, what we have are, are projects. Each project may have multiple data sets associated with it. Each data set may have multiple tables or data objects associated with it. And then each table has a list of variables, and then it has the, and then some of those variables that are, are factor type variables or coded variables may then have codes that go along, along with those. Um, the data objects things tends to be for things like GIS data and things like that, the non-tabular types of uh, types of data. Um, and then for all of those, those are then linked to tables that describe locations. So we have a set of named locations, each of which has is associated with coordinates, and those named locations can be associated with each data set. And uh, similarly, keywords. Um, and then uh, the information on where the file is physically stored on my system and whether or not I have permission to publish that data and that sort of thing is in this table. I've got sort of a dotted line there because this is one that is not accessible through the web form system. This is one that only I can get at. The investigators cannot. Uh, let's see. On the, uh, it doesn't seem to like my Thunderbird there. Anyway. Are there any uh, any questions on sort of the, the 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 general structure of our metadata base? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands waving out there, so I'll I'll move on a little bit here. So um, I thought I'd show you a little bit of our forms here. So this is uh, what the form system looks like, um, and I'm just going to a live demo here. Uh, is everybody seeing that new uh, uh, web page popped up? Okay, so one of the options is that I could go in here and select any data set and go in and edit it, but I also give each of the investigators, and all of the investigators have a login for doing this, a My Datasets page. And so this one then lists the data sets that particularly belong or are associated with a particular investigator and gives you the option of, if you want to, we can go in and, uh, and edit that, uh, that data. So let's see, now maybe we'll go look at the stuff for uh, uh, Assateague Island there, which was where I did my master's thesis. So needless to say, I archived that data. Uh, so if I want to, I can go in and click and hit edit, and then that brings up the page that contains the links to each of sort of the sections of information. So I've got my basic data set information and that's going to have things like what's the title, what was the starting time, what was the ending time, what was the general location, how, how can I share this data, what are the LTER core areas, and you know what's the general form of the data there. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, and then I've got, uh, you know, basically a place where you can enter text that describes what that data is about. In this case, that's a fairly short abstract. Uh, and then I have a place where you can enter data set contacts, either by giving sort of their LTER net identifier, which was first initial plus last name. And if they're already in our personnel directory, then I go and get all the other information from the personnel directory. If they're not in our personnel directory, there's the opportunity to just fill out the basic contact mm -hmm. there. Um, so, um, and then uh, we can add keywords. The keywords here use an autocomplete. So if I, uh, if I was going to put in fish, it automatically fires up. This is the list of um, of keywords that are recognized by the LTER uh, controlled vocabulary. This is using uh, just a, a little web service that's, uh, that's available for that, that, uh, that gives me that, uh, that list. Anybody have a keyword they'd like to, like to see looked up? 
not a one. Okay, well, I'll, I knew somebody out there want, must, want, must want forests. So see, we've got lots of forest things going there. Um, all of these uh, uh, things uh, uh, have, uh, have some help sort of associated with them there because the idea is that this is a page that investigators themselves could use. Now, and then uh, when we get down to tables, we can add different tables and then we can uh, do the variables that are in, in each table. And um, if we look at, uh, At a variable, you, there you've got all of the descriptions, what the units are, missing value codes, is it coded or not, and so forth. And then since this one was coded, um, I can see what codes have already been put in, and if I wanted to, I could put the value for the code, what the code is, and then what, what it means there, and it would add it to the list. Um, and then down below here, I have sort of a lot of blocks that are sort of text things that could be could be added. Um, so that's the, the the basic form system that we have. Now, what we uh, tend to find is that um, uh, let me uh, get back to the PowerPoint here. Um, is that that. Uh, we do have the web form. It is designed to be used by the investigators, but they don't use it a whole lot. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, but the, uh, the big thing that I like about it is it gives me plausible deniability. If anybody says that there's something wrong with their metadata, I can tell them that they have all of the power in the world to go in and fix it themselves. They don't need to wait for me to do it. So generally speaking, what will happen is if somebody gives me a, a data file, uh, well, this is, the, this is where the challenge comes in, is often if somebody gives me a data file, that data file is not ready to be described because typically it's got things like lack of consistent columns. It may be that there are the column headings, there's multiple lines of column headings. It might be that the variable names include spaces or even mathematical operations or special characters. Uh, some really sort of bad practice goes on out there, even among people who think, you know, have, have the basic idea of you'd like data in columns. Um, we've all seen sort of the nightmare uh, table of where somebody has uh, gone out and produced a little mini data table for each time they, uh, they sampled and those data tables are inconsistent and they're just sort of stuck there in the spreadsheet. Just, just disastrous. Um, so usually what will happen is I will ask them to give me a copy of the, 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 the spreadsheet file. I will try to knock it into um, a reasonable form, which usually doesn't take very long. This is, you're correcting some header lines often or, or maybe dealing with inconsistent dates or codes. Uh, and then at that point, usually what I'll do is just fire up those forms and knock out sort of a quick version of the, of the metadata uh, in, the, in the form. And then what I will do is send them links to, here's how you can see what the for what data is in there or what metadata is in there already and here's the place where you can go and edit it and make any changes that you would would like now i have to confess that not everybody makes as many changes as i would like them to but generally speaking uh, uh, you know that's the the procedure that we do i would love to have it that uh that i could just send the investigators you know straight into the form system but the problem is if that data isn't in a reasonable form to begin with, and the uh, I know that there had been attempts by Data One to come up with an Excel tool called uh, Data Up that was supposed to tell everybody about all of the problems with their spreadsheets, but the problem is it always listed so many problems, everybody got discouraged and just went the other way. So generally speaking, that's, that's why we, we sort of do it that way. But um, anyway, generally speaking, I find the form system to be uh, to be quite easy to use, and uh, and of course, I've got my own little secret methods of doing things if I have to. Um, now, we've got our data, our metadata in the in the metadata base. Uh, 
What I then do in order to generate the actual EML uh, documents and then uh, also an index of those documents that I can use in my data catalog um, is to basically run a Perl program. And this is the, the, I won't say the mother of all Perl programs, but it's, it's got to deal with the complexity of EML, so it's a complex program. So what I do is I have subroutines that correspond to specific EML tags. So there's, you know, a, a, uh, a subroutine in the Perl program that deals with, with parties. And I've got another subroutine that deals with coverages. And I've got another subroutine that deals with data tables, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, so that it's, uh, it's not... Uh, not too inscrutable. So if you want to go in and change something about the way a particular thing is being done, you can find it fairly quickly and despite the fact that it's a long uh, Perl program. And mostly what it's doing is just making calls on the SQL database. You know, uh, what's the title? Go to the database and get the title. Print out the title tag. Put the title in the middle. End the title tag. You know, all of that, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, in some cases, the, uh, some of the metadata is actually stored in text files, not actually inside the, the database. So it has the ability to go out and fetch those in. Uh, and then uh, uh, also I have some things that, uh, like for instance, if you wanna know what are the line terminators on something, well, the problem is that sometimes when I upload a file, I forget to tell it to click the little box that says do it as ASCII, so it comes up with, with Word or with the Windows type terminators on a Linux system. And so rather than trying to be rigid about always doing it exactly the same way, I just have a little program that goes out and figures out what the most frequent line terminator is in the first 50 lines of, of the output of the data file and then reports that back and, that, and then the Perl program goes and sticks that into the the EML. And then for some things, uh, in particular, the, the spatial data there, uh, that one is a, is a tricky one because mo for the most part, we're dealing with ArcGIS uh, uh, shape files and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, geodata, well, not geodatabases so much, but uh, rasters. And uh, those actually have their own metadata functions. So they've got a place where you can fill in what's the abstract and, you know, what's the dates and all of that stuff that we're eventually going to need again. But at the same time, I don't want to have it only in the EML. I want to have it in with that, uh, that spatial data as well. So there, what we have is a, a procedure whereby you go and you put the, the GIS data, metadata into a particular format then you go and uh, and fill out that metadata with the information that needs to go into that. And then what happens is that we then run some scripts that, that extract that information, put it into the spatial vector and, uh, and uh, spatial raster uh, EML, you know, XML code. And then we just store a copy of that snippet in, um, uh, in our database. And so, what will happen is if we will, if it's a spatial uh, vector, we'll go out and look to see, hey, is that uh, spatial vector code there? And if it is, we'll just pull it in. Uh, but generally speaking, we prefer to do it more, more automatically. Um, yeah, now the, uh, this is what sort of the display of a data set looks like on our site. And this one is entirely driven by EML. If you give me one of your EML files, I can make it look just like this. Um, uh, this is a, uh, a set of spreadsheet or a set of style sheets that started off with, with I believe, Pisco and uh, Margaret and, uh, and Gastille have been, uh, have, have been using them. Obviously, we've customized things like the header up at the top and things like that. So there's little tweaks, but this is basically sort of a library of, uh, of style sheets that produce this tabbed output. And you can click on the tabs in order to see sort of any of the any different elements there. But the idea- Whoever's typing, please uh, mute, please. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, the um, uh, 
any uh, any questions on sort of the sort of that part of things before we go on to the um, uh, the the sensor data, Jonathan? Uh, you got to unmute there. Uh, was um, how do you make how, just just a question for my own? Uh, how do you make your forms? Uh, basically, uh, these forms, as you'll see when I talk about the history, were actually created in 1997. And so if I were to, and they're basically hand-coded forms. Uh, oh, they're at, they're, they're, oh, I almost said at, say, get, and I'm dating myself there. Yes. Um, um, yeah, basically, if I, if, I, if I were doing them now in a similar way, I would be using PHP in order to do it. Okay, because I would like a set of, I would like to make a set of web-based forms to access the stuff for us. I, I you know, I, I do like you do. I have access forms. I have things like that. But I haven't found a good suite of forms for online access to, let's say, a SQL Server. Right. Well, one of the things that I have done in the past, and I'd have to have to exhume that code. Now, one of the things is, since this was done in 1997 originally, and PHP did not exist, it's actually using a, a, a somewhat obsolete system that still works fine. What's it called? Well, the thing is that this was back in the days where, where mini SQL was the, was the better thing to use because MySQL hadn't come along. The good news is that it turns out that uh, the export program in mini SQL makes metadata that can easily be imported to MySQL. So at this point, I'm using mini SQL for the form inputs, and then that copies to a mini SQL database, and then I just export the whole mini SQL database over to MySQL, and everything else uses MySQL. And if I were ever and if I were going to go back and redo the forms, I would be doing them in PHP and MySQL all the way. But I'm sort of loath to throw away the forms that that work. But one of the things that I did at that time was I also took and wrote some, uh, uh, I believe it was Perl code at that time, I do it in Python now, that actually went out and looked at the database structure and would create for me a, yeah. a raw form that I could then go in and customize. Yeah, I, I remember writing something like that myself. Right. And I, and I do actually have sort of a back-end program that uh, – is sort of more generalized in terms of the fact that you can give it the data from many different forms and it will know how to put it in the right databases and things like that. Uh, though you could also set up a, you know, if you're going to be generating a form, you can also generate sort of the, the receiving form, you know, because there's two issues with the form is one, get the data into the form. And then the question is get the data out of the form and into the database. Yeah. Yeah. Which was my second question. How are, yes. you connect, how are you connecting to the database in those screens you were showing us? Uh, basically, uh, what, it, what it does is it's actually uh, their standard HTML forms. So it is simply going to a particular database, to a, uh, a Perl program, and I'm telling it what the data table is, and I'm telling it what the, uh, uh, what the fields are that need to be updated, and it goes and does them. But it's also possible to do it just by, uh, by, at the same time you're generating that basic form, you can also generate a basic, take what came from the form and copy it over into the database. I'm not sure how, that's what I'm, yeah. Uh, yep. But you're using Perl and it's talking to MySQL. Right. Yes. Yes. And, and that's one of the nice things about the, uh, the relational databases. Uh, let's see, I think I mentioned up here is that that's just it is once you're using things in a relational database, you can pick what you want to use to talk to it. Yeah. Yeah. I've never found any of them to be easy. <laughs> yeah, they're they're not. Once you get used to them, they're not too bad. The other thing also that's good is what you can often do is take the that actual functionality and put it in a function or subroutine that you understand. And then what you do is you just call that, and and that way it it can make it a lot easier. There, that also helps when they when they update the way these things interface. And at the risk of using up too much of your time. <laughs> 
why is some of your metadata in text files that are separate? Uh, basically, it had to, there were a couple things about it. Uh, one of them was I had had a particularly bad experience with DBase three, completely <laughs> scrambling up a bunch of text I had. Yeah, uh, that that was that was one of them. The other thing it also is means that when you're backing up or copying your database over, you're not copying big blocks of text around. But it's I I agree with you entirely. Oh. By today's standards, that would be an appropriate thing to do. Okay, so it's not it's not like there's a reason to do it. It's just right. There's there's, a, there's no current reason to do it. The reason yeah. to do it is historical. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, it's the twenty for the sixty nine bit service, and uh, you said was that a question from? Okay, all right, we got it there. Um, so. Moving on to, to some sensor data processing. Uh, mostly where I'm working on on this figure is in between, is level zero through level one, okay? Uh, I guess we do have some value added data, but mostly we're concerned about getting it to the level one point. And this is actually, tends to be actually a, quite a science project to do, to do this part of it. Um, Generally speaking, for our streaming data, for our data that's coming in, you know, on an hourly basis, or in some cases every 10 seconds, uh, this is the, the sort of the, the, the general process that you're talking about is you've got your new data, you got your old data, you're going to merge those together, you're going to eliminate any duplicates. Uh, which I find much easier than guaranteeing that the new data and the old data never overlap. It's much easier to accept the fact that somebody's going to give you the same data file twice and, and be prepared for it. Uh, the, um, uh, now, one of the things that helps is uh, starting in 2002, we established a wireless network out to our barrier islands. So we have a 22 kilometer long, this red line here is 22 kilometers out to the barrier island where it sits on top of a, uh, uh, a, a tower. Um, and then from there it goes to the north end of Hog Island, it goes to our uh, uh, flux tower, it goes to all of our uh, groundwater wells and meteorological stations and tide stations on the north end of Hog. Right now, the William and Mary uh, Falcon cam is down, but otherwise it would go down there as well. Um, very helpful to us because it means that the data comes in every day. You don't have to wait for some technician to go out in the field and dump it. Uh, it really helps things. And so what we then do is that we've got all the data loggers that are out there in the field measuring. They then connect up via one of the Campbell standard Campbell scientific uh, I think it's RF-401 uh, radio. We then run that through a serial to Ethernet converter, throw it onto the wireless Ethernet. It then goes back to our laboratory where there's a, a PC running on, or a, a virtual PC running on a machine stuck in the closet of the lab. Uh, the reason that we do it there and don't go direct back to UVA is it means that all of the chatter back and forth between the data loggers, and there can be quite a bit of it, stays on the local network and isn't clogging up our main uh, internet connection. And then every couple hours, we then copy it to a computer back at UVA that then does some pre-processing on it and then dumps it off to uh, a server running R and then it goes and does our, our outputs there. Um, the, uh, the oldest one that we have actually goes back to 1994. This is using SAS. R did not exist at this time. Uh, and also, SAS is still real good now, so why, why fight it? But anyway, uh, this is basically sort of the, the steps. We've got some batch files and some shell scripts in there. Um, and so, you know, it, it combines the CSV files and then it runs the... Uh, that initial merging program. And then we'll talk about this in a second. There's a, I actually use a web service to go out and get ways to, to actually fix the data. To, in other words, go from that level zero to level one data. And then finally, we actually have a job that generates graphics and reports. 
and post it on the web. So all of that stuff that you see there on the web page is actually written by the SAS program. It just saves the, uh, the, the graphics files onto a place that the web server can get at them, and it saves an HTML file for me. Now that's gotten a whole lot easier since 1994, because at this point here, this is all just a bunch of put statements. In other words, just a bunch of print statements that are including the HTML code and things like that. But nowadays, you know, everything SAS are all of that already are things that will create HTML output for you automatically. Um, now, uh, talking about sensor problems, this is, this is, uh, something that's still sort of a little bit under development for my, the, all of the forms here are not yet sort of fully populated. But um, one of the, there's sort of a couple approaches that are being used in the network. One of them is the one that Wade is using, where basically what happens is that you pull in data, you run it through that particular data through a, uh, a set of manipulations or a set of checks, you make corrections to it, and then you write that level one data out, and then you're ready for the next time new data, data comes in. Well, since we have sort of that data streaming in, I don't really want to come into the office each day and go through those, those steps with the data that arrived that day uh, in order to, 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 to do that. I, would, I want to have a workflow that's sort of going to do it for me. But at the same time, also, I realize that there are going to be problems in that data that need to be flagged and things like that. So, what I have is I have a, a sensor problem database, or sensor prob, as I call it. Uh, and what it is, is it's a database that simply contains information about known problems with sensors, including, you know, what station were they at, what, well, you'll see in a second uh, uh, the, the questions that I ask. And once they're in the database, well, then I can generate a report, or I can also generate code that when run will actually go in and take the level one data and make it into level two data. Uh, so uh, here's sort of an example of the form on that. So I, I start off, I've got some sort of problem with one of my stations. I say it's a meteorological station. Then it asks me which meteorological station it is and I can uh, record what date and time the problem started and ended. Uh, and then uh, that takes me to the form that lists which sensors are on that station, and I can check off which ones are bad, which ones are having problems, and then I can select what, what I should do, and then I can select, you know, what flags might go along with it, and then I can give it a comment. So if my wind sensor fell down on the ground, by the way, this is not a real problem. I was just populating this. Obviously, you don't want to be reporting on that wind data uh, because it's uh, the, 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 the sensor doesn't have it. Uh, once I've got that information in the database, then what I can do is to get a report. So here's a copy of the report that says, you know, I had this uh, at this station, start at these dates and times, this sensor was down, here's the, the code, all of that. Or I can have it generate some SAS code or R code, depending on which I'd like to do, where it goes through and actually says, okay, problem 26 was on these dates. And that's this, at this point here, that's just a, uh, a comment. And then down here, it's got the actual SAS code that it would take to make those changes to my level zero data to create the, the level one data. And the thing I like about this is it's completely repeatable in the sense that if I go in and change something in the database, all my code changes to reflect that as well. Uh, and since I've always got the level zero data and it's never been changed, if I make a gross blunder and set all of the wind data in the entire record to nothing, in my level one data, well, all I have to do is go back and fix it in the database and rerun it and boom, it's, it's, it's back again. So that's... Uh, uh, sort of the, the things there. Um, now, uh, Kristen was talking sort of about tools. I love to sort of make little tools to do things. I'm not real big on giant humongous programs, but I love to make some tools. Uh, so some of the tools that we have uh, that are 
uh, have actually been published as web services uh, is one that will take you give it an EML document it will give you back a KML file that has the points that were represented in that EML document. We've got the the statistical program generation that's used in the LTR data portal that will generate the R code or the SAS code or the SPSS code or the MATLAB code for any particular data set. Though I give full credit to Wade on the MATLAB code part of it. Uh, there's um, uh, Pasta Summary is a um, is a program that I wrote that actually on the first day of each month sends out to each investigator a listing of what they uh, uh, what data sets they had online on pasta that were and how often they were downloaded and and if possible who downloaded them most of the time it's just public but uh, but anyway I like the investigators to know that those are being used and then uh, uh, pasta use count uh, just uh, for the annual NSF report, I always like to report on how often our data was downloaded. That summarizes that. I've got another program that I run that tells me what in the metadatabase or what in the current, you know, on my local site version of the EML documents has not yet been published to PASTA so that I can, can see if uh, some need to be updated on PASTA. Um, a new one that I just did is EML stats and what it does is it actually you may might have, you may or may not have noticed but I actually downloaded every EML document in the LTR network and then counted things like how many attributes were in that one how many uh, um, uh, locations how many keywords uh, this was primarily for a group that was interested in finding uh, data sets that had lots of locations and also lots of taxa. And so, but I figured as long as I was in, in for that, I might as well do the other. Um, and then uh, I've also got a style sheet that will work with EndNote to make it so NSF will actually ingest your publication reports. Uh, and those are all sort of available. If you need them, most of these are just, uh, just Python code. Uh, and uh, some of them, like I say, are exposed as web services, so you don't even need to know what language they were. And then uh, finally, uh, this is just sort of a, a timeline of, uh, of how things started in our system. Our metadata system, and I have to say that the actual database structure has changed remarkably little, was on a PC using DBase3. Now at that point, you know, if an investigator wanted to come and type in metadata, they had to come into my office and sit down next to me and use the arcane DBase three uh, uh, tools in order to in order to do that. A uh, big thing obviously happened about four years later when all of a sudden we had uh, 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 internet information servers starting off with Gopher and then evolving fairly rapidly to the web. Uh, 95 was when I first fired up my mini SQL and uh, did a person converted our personnel database from uh, DBase 3 into uh, into uh, mini SQL with forms and all of those sorts of things. Um, and then in 1997, that was when I did those uh, the the first well pretty much those forms as you saw them. I've added some tweaks here and there, but for the most part, they, they are as they were done back then. Um, and note that back in 1999, I could actually produce SPSS and SAS programs. Then I was doing it directly from the metadata base. And it wouldn't have worked for anybody else because you would have had to have my metadata base to do it. Uh, Starting 2002, we got our wireless connection to the uh, field site. Obviously, that started a lot of the sort of streaming data types of things. Uh, by 2004, we had the, the, uh, the uh, uh, EML metadata was, uh, was now uh, finalized and, uh, and available. Um, and then sort of on the more recent stuff, uh, in 2011, we bundled up all of the, the web services for converting EML to R, SAS, SPSS, and MATLAB. And uh, that's now on the LTR data portal. Uh, we also in 2012, it used to be that we had all of our metadata, our metadata displays were run directly from the metadata base. In other words, I just printed out 
the data from the metadata base onto the screen. We shifted though to using those set of style sheets that we share with uh, Gastiel and, and Margaret. Uh, by the way, one of the, uh, the things that's nice about that system is since it only depends on access to the XML uh, documents, um, if you want to fetch the XML documents back from pasta or whatever, as a matter of fact, when we first did this system, uh, this was before pasta was there, uh, we actually used to get all of our data set indices and, and the EML metadata from the uh, LTR Metacat server. So we didn't actually have to do that part of the system at all. We were just taking and restyling it and then displaying it. When Metacat went away, we had to do a little bit of scrambling. So right now it's looking at a local set of documents, but it's really easy to make this system point to metadata that's stored in, you know, non-locally, let's put it that way. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, I've talked about some of the, the tool types of things that we've done there. And, uh, and prior to the start of this, I was talking to Stephen about some of the taxonomic coverage element stuff by using uh, the EMLR package there. Um, so my philosophy on all this stuff is uh, create reusable workflows whenever possible, okay? Uh, generally speaking, creating a workflow takes one and a half to two times the amount of time that it would take to actually just do the thing and move on. But if you're ever going to have to do it again, it pays off big time. Uh, I can't, you know, I, I, I am not sitting there every three hours processing our meteorological data because it's, it's doing it there. Um, I've seen some situations of where there's this absolutely wonderful tool but I know that if I get into it, I may never get out of it. And I'm not sure that anybody else is going to do it and so forth. So, uh, so I, I tend to be fairly conservative about what I will, will invest in. So right now I'm doing a lot with uh, Python and R, uh, you know, that sort of thing uh, uh, tends to be it and, and many in my SQL. And then, uh, you know, it goes without saying, don't put data or metadata into something you aren't sure you can get it out of. <laughs> Fortunately, EML is one of those things you can get it out of pretty easily. So if I figure if you got EML, you can be fairly satisfied about your, your metadata. So um, are there any, uh, any questions? Hopefully I, I went through that uh, at sort of warp speed there, but, uh, uh, and if anybody needs sort of any, any help on particular things, I would, ab I would absolutely give you my metadata model for my metadata base, except that I'm sure that you could do a better job on the data modeling on it there. Uh, you're welcome to use mine to look at, but there were things that I did, did then when I was learning that I would not do now that I'm much more experienced with. It. So anyway. You want to tell people where they can get that style sheet to... Uh... Uh, let's see. Uh, with the tab format for the metadata and EML. Uh, yeah, well, just I, I would say that uh, probably if you want to, I will be glad to send you our, you know, the copy of our directory that's styled our way. But I got it originally from Margaret, and Margaret is I consider Margaret to be the master of these things. Well, Margaret and Gastille, because. I can never get either one of them to admit to it because Margaret always says it's Gastille and Gastille always says it's Margaret. But all I know is that the good, good things done. Um, Are there other questions? See. I'll uh, stop sharing there unless somebody needs to see something else up. Go ahead, Tim. Your website has a lot of amazing and various content on it and functionality and it's intimidating to me since I don't have anything right now set up and I'm, I'm wondering based on maybe statistics about different page views, what are the, the one or two core pages that I should start with as I start building my site? Um, yeah, the, um, let's see, the the truth be told, I could fire up. I, it actually has Google Analytics on it, but the problem is I haven't looked at it that frequently. The, the big thing that I would say is let your investigators be your guide. Ask them what 
they need access to. So there's some obvious things like the document section of where, yeah, you want to make sure that they can get a copy of the proposal because everybody wants to look at that. Um, the, um, let's see, if you want to tell you what, maybe I will share the screen again and I'll just go back to that, uh, that diagram I have on, uh, on what's on our website um, to do it there. The, um, the personnel directory also, though these days people are, there's more sort of ways to find out email addresses, but when we first started, you were basically out of luck if, uh, if you didn't know somebody's email address without having to look it up. <laughs> uh, so that was, that was sort of a big one, big one for us. Uh, so the proposal section here, uh, uh, keeping track of sort of theses and dissertations. These days, more institutions are doing that, so it really can just be a link to it uh, rather than actually having to archive the document itself. Um, the uh, the bibliography for the site is obviously something people like to, you like to sort of wave around what's been published. You're going to need that for annual reports anyway. Um, and uh, currently, the way we're doing that is we actually maintain the database in EndNote, and then I'm exporting it to Zotero, and then I'm using a uh, WordPress widget that imports it from Zotero. So <laughs> it's, oh, what a tangled web we weave. But uh, uh, anyway, the, uh, there's lots of ways to sort of manage bibliographies, either on the web or, or whatever. Um, the... Um, the data section we have sort of talked about. Uh, we do have some interactive databases that are actually built on top of either MiniSQL or MySQL that do the um, that allow you to do things like we've got a biodiversity database, so you can put in the name of a species and it will tell you which islands we've seen it on, that sort of thing. Uh, that's one that isn't in the data catalog per se because you really have to use it. It's, there's not a whole lot of point of just having a giant, giant table there, though I promised Corinna I would put the giant table there. So uh, this will happen. Um, uh, and that's, those are, but the thing is, keep in mind, you know, that, that la those last three pages was, you know, it was little stuff done each year. There wasn't any year that we did miracles except for maybe the year we got the web page up and i have to give full credit to a fellow named harvey chin who was a graduate student working with one of the investigators who was associated with the lpr network office and what he did was put a package together that basically gave you the basic web server code that you needed to set the web server up and you know a first home page that you could then uh, sit down and alter and he sent that out to all the LTR sites and so as a result we were nine months to a year ahead of the rest of the uh, biological community in terms of getting that up. Um, so um, the um, the ones that uh, are invest of course our lead investigator likes are the research themes and research highlights because that's sort of more your public outreach sort of thing. But, uh, but my focus tends to be more on sort of the, the stuff that people might be able to use. Things like the photos and stuff are actually pretty easy to set up because again, there's P Pywigo, I think it is, and, and uh, if you're using Drupal, Drupal's got its photo stuff, and uh, you know, there's all sorts of options for doing uh, capturing photos. And I'd like to use those because uh, uh, we have, uh, well, they turn out to be really handy to have old photos around and keeping them on the web is about the only place I can be guaranteed of finding them. Uh, but uh, but it's, it's, it's a little bit, it's baby steps. That, that's that's all, all, there, all there is to it. And uh, the one thing I will say if, in terms of sort of the historical approach on it is always remember that nothing is forever. <laughs> Uh, you know, any system that you're putting something in, you're going to have to get it out of. And anything that you make that's so utterly complex, eventually <laughs> you're going to have to deal with that complexity. So, um, uh, but, they're, but they're nice intermediate things because, you know, in principle, if you wanted to go to a different meta database and for some reason the so software that you were using to generate your uh, uh, EML wasn't really working very well. You can always go to the EML and use that to populate your new 
your new tool or database with. Um, and, and as I said in one of the slides, XML is itself almost a database. So in terms of the ability to go in and retrieve specific chunked up uh, information in an automated way. Does that, uh, I think I answered that you need everything, Tim, but, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but the, the big thing is to, uh, to, is to get started. And like I say, things like proposals or, you know, list of PIs and their email addresses, or in telephone numbers, those are all things that the people in your project are going to are going to need uh, sooner rather than later. Does anybody else have uh, uh, this, this? This is not not a unique thing. Well, so Jonathan, Kristen, give me a vote on what was the most important thing there. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to answer you with a question. <laughs> Um, you have a metadata model, and I believe other people have developed their own metadata models for their databases. Do you know how yours compares to, say, the metadata base that is used by Wade and I think some other sites? Uh, yeah, I, think, I believe Gastille and Margaret at the, the Morea and the, and the uh, SBC site are also ones. Um, I think there's a, there, there are... I think that the dissimilarities tend to be more around the edges mm -hmm. in the sense that you more or less, to, the one thing that might be different in our data model is originally our data model did not support multiple tables per data set. And we got around that by having multiple data sets per project, each of which described one table. Mm. And by the time they came along, it was clear that each data set should be able to support multiple tables. Okay. And so their their model is sort of more flexible that way. Now, as you can see, I have taken and gone back and changed my model so it now supports multiple tables. Okay. Okay. So um, and so now uh, and that was basically in my case it was just simply adding a table number field to the variables table. Mm -hmm. uh, Seems like it'd be a really nice thing for the IM community to have. Sort of thing, sort of you know, off the shelf that would do what your metadata forms I, I, plus I, I, data place pl yeah. plus um, Perl script do. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that that's a I think that that's a possible thing to do now, especially because if you can make it something that you can populate from EML, then you'll know you'll be able to put everything back in the EML if you if you needed to. Um, the other thing is also actually Gastille around I think two all scientists meetings ago actually started a pro project where she was looking at different metadata base models. So it may be that there's actually is some documentation out there, or some PowerPoint presentations that actually show some of the differences between them. Uh, uh, so Gastel has written something 2010 actually. Um, I yeah. guess is when she did this project. Gastel, do you have any more comments to make about the comparison of this data model to um, the one you use? Mm, I guess Can not. You hear me now? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was actually trying to talk over John a minute ago because I wanted to point out that Wade's metabase originally was also one-to-one -one with entities and at the time we ported it for MCR and SPC that's when he also added multiple entities. Yeah it was 2010 and John Porter's was one of the inspiring models that I looked at uh, because of its completeness. Um, I think it might have been the limitations of mini SQL that it, it didn't have as elaborate of a normalization but it it, ha it was one of the com more complete ones as far as the, the, all the different entities you could relate. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so the poster hasn't been updated since 2010, and it would be an interesting snapshot in time to compare to now. A lot of sites have adopted Deems since then. Deems was brand new then, and it's on the poster. And it's come a long way since the model th that it had in 2010. Um, right. So the metadata, you have something like a mini metadata base, correct? Do you have forms to enter the metadata? And we, 
at MCR, we only have the big metabase, but SBC has, has now forked a mini metabase as well, which is a version of metabase with just the essential bits. Okay. Is, are there forms for, data, for metadata entry for both of those systems or one of them? Yes and no. Um, there were, was, Margaret did make some forms, but uh, we backed off of that. And be, just because our, our own working practices, it was easier to directly enter the okay. content. But the, the new person that's helping Margaret, Lee Quay, she is now, I believe, tackling that with R because she's using R with EML and she's enjoying writing our code with with her mini metabase so that just that idea just popped up this week so I that's a very new project okay thanks I was just curious what else is out there yeah does anyone else have a question for John I can't Go Steven ahead. yeah so this isn't so much for John necessarily but maybe all the IMs on the panel that that might benefit the, uh, the kind of the, the people coming into the system. And it's too late for me, but kind of based on the conversation we were just having and something that came up in a data checks meeting the other week, you know, you're talking about a data, the metadata model, but what about the kind of the broader bifurcation of not having your metadata in a database, which, which is what we do at CAP. Do you, I mean, I wonder if the group has any thoughts on the pros and cons of going down one of those two roads. Yeah. I, 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 let, me, let me throw in the observation that if you've got it in EML, I consider that you sort of have it in a database, okay, because you can't, in fact, uh, do that. And, one and the other approach that tends to be more, uh, there's sort of the, a bunch of sites that have uh, some form of metadata base. And then there are other sites that tend to do, uh, that have uh, uh, sort of typically spreadsheet-based forms that then go through a translator to directly create the EML. Uh, and then there are others that actually just, you know, edit the EML in an XML editor and, and that sort of thing. Uh, the, uh, so those are, are uh, th those sort of fall under, under sort of three different, uh, different rubrics there. I sort of count Deems as being a metadata base one, even though it's, it's, you know, it's embedded inside a much more elaborate, uh, elaborate tool there. Um, but I don't, um, I don't know, I guess the thing that I've liked particularly about the having the metadata base is that, I mean, I've moved it between now three different database systems over time, and I've never had any real trouble doing it. Um, now with a XSLT and the XML tools out there. I'm not sure that I would have had a trouble with XML, but I promise you I would have had trouble with XML back in 1989 because it wouldn't be invented for another 15 years, but, or at least come into wide use. So, uh, I, it's it. I don't think that there's a a a definite. This is the only way you should go. Uh, it depends a little bit on what you on what your expertise is. Um, I mean, there's a reason that databases exist out there. Uh, but my sense is that the, the traditional structured query language database is much more suitable for metadata where you're going in and you're updating things and you're, cha you know, you're changing things in a random way as compared to scientific data where mostly you're just appending. And you don't really need a database to append. So anyway. I, I'll throw it open to others. I didn't mean to monopolize. I guess at the FCE, we use the Excel template to EML model. And I've always wished that we had the, the metadata in a database so we could do more with it. It's pretty limited with what you can do with it the way we have it. So what are you trying to do with that? What is it that you can't do? Um, well, a lot of information gets uh, copied from the EML into the database. And we just haven't been able to do some of the, the data catalog things that I want to do. But we're going to go, we're, we're planning to adopt the um, 
system of using pasta to get the uh, the EML and then display it with, with style sheets. So that's going to take care of that problem. But I've just always felt like it, we would have more flexibility with what we could do if the data were in a, if the metadata were in a database. What's your feeling about that? Me? Mm -hmm. um, so I think what John just presented is, is an extremely good philosophy. If you have lots of different pieces that you somehow manage to make work together, everything is so much more flexible and you can update parts of it while others are staying the way they have worked. And so I'm, I really would like to explore and think about that sort of direction. And so not everyone likes R, but somehow the same functionality is in Python and it, maybe we can, we can rally around little bits and pieces and make them work together with yeah, with a code that, that people like to develop. And I'm, like Steve, I'm not, and Steven, I'm not convinced that the database really is the solution to it all. So I'm, I'm just not quite sure how much longer these monolithic systems will work, like Teams and um, what other sites have for everything everything is, is sort of custom built and yes, it's very automatic right now, but what if one of these pieces breaks and... I was thinking of the poor fellow that inherits all John's forms when he retires. Oh my, or, or gal, oh my word. There's that, yes. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I, 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 my, my personal thing is I'm going to say, here's the EML document. You can harvest what you need out of them. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but, but the truth be told, actually, I, I, I tend not to be a big normalizer. So the databases or are, are, are the data tables are actually fairly scrutable. But, uh, but yeah, uh, there is a, a tendency to sort of maybe accumulate uh, uh, things as you as you go along. But I, one of the things that, that uh, Corinna hit on that I think is, is really important is that I don't want to recreate the whole thing at once. I want to take the squeakiest wheel in my system. I want to fix that and make it so it's now the fastest, greasiest, you know, ready to go uh, uh, part of the system. And then I can move on to the thing that's now sort of the creakiest and, and fix that. Also, what Corinna said was that these days, you really don't need to be having sort of a, a complex system for managing the EML on your site if you have a good way of getting it into pasta, because there's good ways of getting it out of pasta. And so maybe I should add to that, that, that Mark and Dwayne are working on, on metadata input forms for PASTA. So that is in the making. And we really have had very good success with our Word document, our metadata template that we're sending out to people and they fill it out. It seems to be much, much less intimidating than any other kind of form. And we are getting getting fairly quick and putting EML together. Yeah, the thing that I have sometimes thought about doing, and I've never sort of really formalized it, is sometimes I will tell people, hey, look, I want you to give me good a spreadsheet with good columns in it. If you want to, take a second one of the sheets and label it metadata, and there tell me what the units are for the different things and what the color, you know, what the, 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 uh, the description of each of the fields that is on the, 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 the main form are. Uh, it seems to me that, that a really skillful, i.e. not me, uh, Excel person could actually make it so that it would look at the top lines on one and automatically populate that metadata form with places to fill in that additional information. The thing that tends to be sort of the hardest is that uh, uh, you're really talking about a structure that's sort of hierarchical you know, in the sense that tables have attributes, attributes have codes, you know, 
uh, and that's something that spreadsheets typically don't do well. But I'm, I'm, I think that a really clever spreadsheet person could go a long ways towards making it so that if somebody just pastes their data in good columns into a spreadsheet, that it would, uh, would, uh, would do a lot of that manipulation. Then it would be nice yeah. if it looked for things like mathematical operators in column headings. Dean says something that will do that. Once you start to import your Excel file, it'll grab all the, the uh, column headers and try and guess if it's a numeric or categorical, stuff like that. But I agree it would be better if it were just something that operated on an Excel file. Well, it's really easy to run that code in R that just reads the data file and grabs the column headers and tells you what type of data is in there. That yeah. That is is really simple to do, and then you've got to then you've got a table that you can read into Excel and fill out the rest, like your column definitions and all uh, and the and the units. I mean, nobody can guess the units anyways, so that still has to be manually filled out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, the reason I was thinking it would be nice to have it actually in the Excel is that I want to have it where somebody can do this before they give it to me. I don't want to have it where they give it to me and then I give it back and then they finish filling in the metadata. That's Yeah, but you can never get around it because you, yeah. can't, you can't anticipate the, the column headings and that is the place where most people make typos. And so it really works much better if, if you have a little bit of an exchange with the person who gives you the data. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, the, the one other innovation I realized I left out of my thing is also our uh, tabular data sets actually come out with a fairly extensive header. They about 20 lines plus the original header line. That's basically sort of a mini version of the metadata that says, here's the link to where the metadata is. Here's the citation you should use for this data set. And the reason we did that is we had a case of where investigator A collected some data they then wrote a paper with investigator B and shared that data with them. And then investigator C collaborated with investigator B. And when they published their paper, they gave all the credit for the data to investigator B. This was not good. <laughs> and so uh, uh, as a result, uh, that happens though at the time of the data download. It actually takes, an, I have a, a directory with all the headers in them and then I have the, the data. And so when you request data, it slaps the header on the front and sends it off to you. But the EML metadata knows about those extra lines. So everything is, is kosher there. So it will work with our code and that sort of thing. But uh, that's, the, that's probably an, another thing we do a little differently there. And also, when the data gets downloaded, there's a, a program is the thing that downloads it, and it automatically uh, triggers counters and things like that. So our EML metadata actually has sort of a count of how many times that data set's been downloaded, so we can use it as a popularity rating in additional metadata. Neat. Are there any other questions? See, I'm seeing tons of chat stuff out here. I haven't opened the chat window yet. Okay. Uh, okay, good. I nothing uh, there. Okay. Great. Well, thanks so much, John. That was great. I'm glad, glad to do. I'm always glad to talk about data management <laughs> or information good. management, and I look forward to hearing what some of you, some of you, uh, the other folks out there are doing. Great. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.